When you first got the call, Rick, what were you told that you were facing? We were told there were 13 people trapped in a cave behind rising flood water. Uh, time was of the essence, but we didn't get there till Wednesday, and by that time the cave was in really high flood water. And we couldn't actually proceed as far as the rescue workers had been two or three days earlier. So we were battling just to go as far as, as people had walked to. So some people, they'd walk to a certain they'd distance? They'd walk to the, that junction, Sayoc. Yeah. That was like the diving rescue operations were starting from there. Yeah. But it took us nearly a week to get there ourselves. But, Jason, when, when uh, Rick talks about getting there and waiting for the phone call, could you just explain to people what that means? Because are you guys sitting there like... Uh, fighter pilots ready to go or, or, or fire officers or are you like international rescue? Um, how do you mobilise? I suppose the international rescue is the best way of describing it. Uh, we're not that fast in mobilising. We're on a, a call-out list with the British Cave Rescue Council and there's three or four of us of the lead divers who are on that list and we get mobilised by the, that council um, via whatever national country it is. So how often would that happen? When was the last time you were mobilised? The last time was uh, February 2014 to Arctic Norway. My word. So it's so... never where you want to be at the right time of year. And you never know when, when that call is, is coming, Chris. Um, so you get there, you're obviously briefed on the situation. What were your thoughts at that point of how the rescue mission was going and how you wanted to conduct your rescue? So obviously Jason and I joined the team after Rick and John had been out there a number of days. Um, we'd had some briefings with them before we arrived. We knew it was going to be an extremely difficult and risky operation um, with not a, not a high probability of, of total success. So we were quite apprehensive about, about the mission. Uh, on our first trip into the cave, uh, Jason and I went to visit the boys, took some food uh, and some wetsuits in, uh, got to see the conditions in the cave. And thankfully, the water levels at that point had began to ease up a little bit. So our progress to the end of the cave wasn't as, as difficult as, as expected. And we began to make an assessment of the viability of, of bringing the boys out. But Chris, when you say you were apprehensive, are you saying to, to us that the idea of a successful rescue wasn't guaranteed? So what we did was unprecedented. The situation was unprecedented. And we tried uh, some techniques that, that had never been tried before. So. We were doubtful of a 100% of a success rate, absolutely. Rick, you were the first to, to reach the boys. You uh, along with and John, John Valanthan. You and yes. John Valanthan. Um, just describe that moment when you appeared and saw them. What was, what was the scene that greeted you? So, well, we were swimming along the surface in the canal. Uh, we were, John and I, having a bit of a discussion because we were coming to the end of the line. I was sniffing the air to, for signs... Any airspace, I was sniffing for signs of human... You can smell human. Well, there are... Yes. Yes. So I smelt them first. And then they obviously heard us talking. We actually saw their lights. They weren't really in view. And then they, they sort of started coming down this slope one by one. So they were on a ledge? They were sort of on a, on a ramp round a corner. And as they were coming down, I was counting them one at a time till I got to 13. We didn't believe that they could stay in there for four months. We actually didn't have time to stock four months of food. It was either bring them out or, or nothing, really. Yeah. And what about and the, the air quality? Quality. That, that was the other issue. The, the air quality yeah. was deteriorating yeah. all the time. The Thai Navy had a plan of uh, laying a, an oxygen pipe all the way through to the ch air chamber to try and replenish that air, but that never actually happened. They never got that pipe through. And, Jason, bringing it all home, that Thai Navy SEAL who lost his life yeah. uh, there as well, I mean, that is a real reality check yeah. uh, for you all. But when you look at you and you know each one of you are responsible for saving lives, in your case, for those boys um, you, you brought through, how precarious was that? What was the worst part of that? What was the best part of that? Uh, actually, for us as the divers, it wasn't... We didn't feel a massive risk to our personal safety. It was the child that we had total responsibility for. And I was very nervous when we took them from the end point and you got into that first flooded section. Until you got a sort of a feel for the way their breathing rhythm was going, it was very nervous for the sort of first five or ten minutes because you just wanted to see those air bubbles coming out of that mask all the time. Yeah. If we did this slodge that mask and broken the seal, water had gone into the mask, there was nothing we could have done. So oh. the sort of first five or ten minutes were very nervous. 
But once you got a feel for the, the how the where the lad was breathing, and you you, you know you, you couldn't avoid banging them against the rocks because of you just think of panic. You know, yeah, all yeah. of us watching this unfold. Well, that's you're one thinking, of them. These boys, some of them couldn't even swim. Yeah. Never scuba dived, obviously, yeah. and so they had to be sedated yeah, to yeah. a degree. They were pretty much unconscious. Yeah. Really. Yeah. It's the only way they survived because we had to protect ourselves because, yeah. like yeah. you say, we didn't want them to panic underwater, and that's the only way we could have got them out. And, and yeah. I want to ask you, you all, do you know what this is? I'm describing a person who is admired for their courage, outstanding achievements, or noble qualities. Do you know what that relates to? That is the definition of a hero. Why do you not see yourselves as heroes? We just, we just did what we're not trained to do, but we're, what we've experienced over the last 25 years. Um, we're happy that we can use that skill set to go and help people. We don't go out there, you know, trying to cover sort of heroism or anything like that. But if, you know, if people want to call us heroes, then... We well, completely we've called are. Heroes. We we've completely are. Heroes. I mean, it was just unbelievable watching that story unfold.